So, hi everybody, my name is Sebastian, as you have heard before, and the first thing I want to say is I love Singapore. I love the food, I love the people, clean streets, I don't like the taxis, especially waiting for them. And some people say it's boring, it's dull city, not special people, whatever, but I think they don't look close enough. I've seen many geeks doing nerdy, funky tech stuff. I've s I see people break dancing on the street and stuff. That's I don't see that in many other Asian cities, and I've seen them all. So that being said, I'm feeling controversial today. Singapore, no emotions, no sex. <laughs> so what better way to start a talk than in Singapore than talking about a young innocent man and his relationships, how he got into, how he got out of them, and how he was facing the ultimate decision, passion or love. So my first time, everybody remembers their first time, my first time was with JavaScript. <laughs> it wasn't very memorable, after a couple of on mass overs it was over. And so I went back to HTML and graphic design. But since then, I've kept going uh, on and off relationship with JavaScript, much like Kate Moss and Peter Hardy, if you know them. <laughs> I find it funny that in 2012, rock stars are no, lo no longer playing guitars, but massaging their keyboards and chopping out JavaScript code. And some people also think I look a little bit like Peter Hardy, the, the rock star. Maybe if I only did JavaScript. And yeah, a few years later I went back to JavaScript. There was this new thing called the HTML, which basically boils down to being Ajax without the Ajax part. <laughs> and did a couple of things that I'm regretting by now. And JavaScript back then was a big drama queen. It just didn't work, and all these cross-browser issues, just pain in the ass. And so I was fed up with it and thought, I need some more inner beauty. And that's how I decided that I should start programming PHP, then Java, and eventually I met Ruby on Rails. But at the same time, uh, with Ruby on Rails, there was also Ajax coming up. So I was a little bit on the side. So there was Ruby that was very nice and doing the job very well and always clean and tidying things up. But there was something about JavaScript. You always needed Ajax. And I had a couple of side gigs with JavaScript doing Ajax, not because out of love, but she paid me, she paid me very well. But something kept me on the server side. I just wanted to be far away from end users. <laughs> But eventually, in 2012, JavaScript sneaked back into my life. And I had to port some CoffeeScript to Ruby, like CoffeeScript classes that sit on the, on the, on the like front end business logic that I had to go back to the server. I said, well, it's kind of similar. But then I had to do some real hardcore JavaScript development doing uh, an iPhone app with Titanium. And I thought, it's still such a drama queen. Nothing works. Everything you take for granted in programming, in a programming language, just doesn't exist. I didn't mind all the JavaScript what the fucks and things like that. But I just minded that I couldn't write what I wanted to do. I always had to write my own functions to round numbers, to capitalize strings. And that's when I really saw that JavaScript might be a nice language. Some disagree. But what really sucks about JavaScript is that the standard library. So. When I had that idea, I kind of, you know, I knew something was different between me and JavaScript. It got more serious, and I knew that it's going to stay when she told me that she's pregnant from me, <laughs> even though we've always used strict mode. <laughs> <laughs> so the baby eventually comes out today early birth, and it's called Four Letter Word JS. And what it is, the four letters start now. What I did is I wrote 100% JavaScript library, took only the good parts, and put the Ruby core classes on top of it. 
So here it is, RubyJS. Uh, it's not released yet. I'm going to release it a little bit later. And I want to stress that RubyJS, uh, well, it's alpha, that's, I don't want to stress that. It's not a new crazy thing. It's just a port of the standard library of Ruby, which everybody loves, who, who uses it, to JavaScript. So we get all the classes like string, regex, match data, arrays, all the crazy iterator stuff, enumerators, different number formats, integer, fixed nums, floats, you can add your own, there's like rational, but I was too lazy to do that, and I never used it. You can use range and time, and hash is coming soon. So to give you a little bit of a perspective on the JavaScript standard library, that's how many methods you have, like maybe 12 for array, maybe 12 for strings, and the occasional other method that are not that useful in the end. And so RubyJS gives you this amount of new methods. So the dots are RubyJS specific methods. So you get a bunch, a whole bunch of new convenience methods for free, more or less, that you can use to write JavaScript. And it's not really about writing Ruby in JavaScript, but it's about writing proper JavaScript, the proper standard library, not reinventing all the things over and over and doing component JS. So Best thing, one example, one line of code says more than 1,000 words. This is Ruby code. So what you do first, you, we, we make an array of three words, looks, fields, and acts. Then we map them, we capitalize them, we join them together, we add like Ruby and center the string, and the thing down step is what you get. So let's put that to uh, JavaScript with the RubyJS library. The first thing does the same. This is just one-to-one -one mapping of that functionality. We get a RubyJS array of three RubyJS strings. And this is Ruby again. And now we have to move that block to the JavaScript equivalent, and all the blocks in RubyJS are simply function calls. And by the way, I'm, I'm using CoffeeScript for that because it just fits better on the slides, basically. You can use it with JavaScript. You can use it with CoffeeScript works both very well. So we have ported the map, and the rest is the same. You can just take it one to one, and it works. So this is the difference. Ruby, RubyJS. Ruby, RubyJS. Same thing, same, same. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, if you write JavaScript, that's how, it's gonna, that's how it looks like. It's just uh, that function part that's a little bit bigger. And to make a fully functional example, all you have to do is import the RubyJS library on top and just paste it in a thing, and I can show you that it works. Uh, here we got the, that file, and we move it to the browser, and it works out of the box, and we're happy. So a second example to show you how it works a little bit better and how the internals work together is we've got an innocent looking JavaScript string A and what you do with it is we wrap it into a RubyJS object and we do that by using the R method and this just maps native JavaScript objects into the corresponding RubyJS object so you can write R with a string, with a number, with an array, with a hash, with a time, date object and so on. And as you can see, you get a RubyJS.String. That's a known class in a known namespace, RubyJS or alias by R. We then just capitalize in, and I took the same methodology that we have in Ruby that you can write bang methods that you change the string internally. So you don't have to write string equals string capitalize. The string capitalize bang just changes the string internally. And you can keep on working with the string variable. What we then do is we, we want to count up to the capital C. And when you write up to C without a block or without a function, we get a uh, RubyJS enumerator. And with that enumerator, it doesn't actually do anything. It's just another object. You can join different iterators. So this is the each cons which 
basically uh, returns arrays. So it would be the first array would be A and B, the second is B and C. And same thing again, if you don't pass it a block, you get an enumerator back. If you do pass it a block like that, you can just output it on the console or do whatever you want, and then it disappears or whatever the implementation is. If you're just interested in, to, in the array, you can call 2a on the enumerator and you get a, an array of these objects back. Or even add more iterators on top of it. And that just works and I tested that pretty well and it's crazy that it works. So how does it work internally? How does the RubyJS object actually look like? Uh, I wrote it in CoffeeScript because it's quite convenient. I didn't use all the features of CoffeeScript because, yeah, it sometimes slows th things a little bit down. So uh, this is an example of a number type, the fixed num, which is like an integer. So you create a new fixed num object just passing a JavaScript uh, primitives uh, number and then it gets added to that native uh, property. And all the other methods, they work with that native property, such as the odd function that checks if it's the number is odd. And the next example is uh, next. And here, this is special because here you can see how it works internally. Everything, all the methods, they return Ruby, other RubyJS objects, and that's how the whole chain ability works. It's chainable by design. And it's also a very lightweight way of doing things. There's not, it's not heavy, it's fast, it's simple. You can easily access the native using a specialized, using a special method to native. So once again, it's 100% JavaScript. You don't need any external tools. It's not like you don't need a compiler, interpreter, or you don't have to change your workflow at all. All you have to do is take the RubyJS and add it to the thing. Next thing that I think is important is there are so many other libraries, JavaScript libraries, they're all inspired by Ruby, but none of them is actually compliant to Ruby. They just take just the parts they think is good and change a little bit, don't do the hard stuff. But RubyJS is, let's say, 97% compliant to Ruby. I took all the Ruby specs that Rubinus uses to test their Ruby implementation and I poured these 20,000 lines of code to JavaScript to test my library. So every method accepts the exact same arguments, the exact same, uh, this fact is the exact same return values, have the exact same behavior as the Ruby equivalent. So there's no, no surprises here. And in total, so it's about 2,000 specs, 6,000 assertions in that test suite. And it plays well with others. You can use it alongside Backbone, jQuery, can replace underscore, and so on. Uh, when I started doing it, I, I, I want to have something pra pragmatic, something that I can just take and put it somewhere, and it's supposed to work. I don't want to add any magic. I don't want to write a new CoffeeScript compiler or whatever. I just so okay, this can work. I do it. So that's what you have to do to get RubyJS. It's chainable, as you have seen. It's chainable, especially across the types. So if you return a, a string with join, you can continue chaining the string methods. That's completely different than when, it's, when you would be using underscore and another string library. Together, I can show you an example for that. Enumerators up to five, up to 10, six times body body. Uh, Ruby is a bit special that it has symbols as method names sometimes, so the equality operator is actually a, a method of an object. And because it cannot write symbols in JavaScript methods, I did it anyway, and, but just enclosing as uh, a whatever, as a string. And for every symbol, I also got a Elias. Elias? Yeah. Uh, if you don't like the underscore syntax, just for you, I made uh, uh, LES them with a capit uh, camel cased method, so you can use either. I've got the special variables covered. If you know Ruby, that might be a big deal. So how does it compare to the other stuff? CoffeeScript and so on. 
Well, sucks, 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 sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, CoffeeScript, it's different. CoffeeScript compiles stuff into JavaScript. Underscore is pretty good, fairly good with arrays and stuff, arrays and working with the native objects. Lodash, I don't know if many people know it, is a kind of drop-in replacement for underscore. It's a little bit more. It's, I check it out. It's a lot faster. It contains a few bug fixes, and it does the same internal uh, performance tuning things like I do with RubyJS. So if you're using underscore, give Lodash a try. It's very good. JS class, I haven't very looked into it, but it's also inspired by Ruby, Ruby a little bit, SugarJS as well. And as I said before, they are inspired, they're not compliant. They, they might do it the same, but you're never quite sure about that. And plus, SugarJS, some people use it. It looks a bit similar, like, but they extend the native objects, the native JavaScript classes, which, in my opinion, is OK, but some people have strong feelings against that. And there's also some things you can't do if you're extending native JavaScript objects, such as destructive methods and so on. Uh, components, yeah, that might be a good choice if you like Gen 2 Linux, configuring pa packages and stuff. What about prototype.js? So one guy told me, well, now I realize your work is supposed to finish what prototype.js once started help Ruby developers in writing JS, but in a clean array. Has some truth in it, but it's not just for Ruby developers. I mean it as a tool for JavaScript developers as well. So what are the benefits of RubyJS for you? One dependency. You probably don't know this mess, so you've got five different libraries all doing something else, all different versions, all a little bit different. One gets updated, and you're never quite sure if it still works. RubyJS, one library. You don't have to worry about the whole dependency management thing for a while. It's one API. We've got underscore something. And if you want to chain it, you have to call underscore chain. And if you want to work with strings, you probably use string chess or something like that. And then it's capital S, string capitalized. And to get the value back, you actually have to append S again. Then if you want to work with times, there's this moment.js, and you have to call moment and format capital L. RubyJS gives you one API. It's all the same. And you don't have to call format capital L, but you can use string format time. I'm missing that. One chain. That's the example if you're using underscore and other libraries. So. You make an array, you map around. In the, in the mapping function, you pour it into the string chess thing, capitalize, turn S, then you join it, then it's a string again, append stuff, and then you have to, to do crazy things. You have to put it into the S again. Just a mess. Here, it's all the same. One documentation, five different libraries, five different documentation. Everybody tries to be creative, makes a nice layout. So hard to get along, really. Some of them are not really good, and it's all a little bit different. Here we get one documentation. It's all in there. I ported not just the code. I also got all the docs, copied in there, adapted the examples to the RubyJS syntax so that it can just go. I'm also adding some notes and to-dos so that you can see which edge cases are not working. And one component. No bike shedding, no discussing about uh, semicolons, whether it should be on the left side or the right side, because I'm doing it and uh, I'm saying how it is. No silly arguments, no dependency management. And if you want to get rid of it, you simply can extract the individual uh, methods to your own stuff, to your own library. Last thing, well, uh, one choice. How much time have you spent switching libraries? Not just your MVC framework. You go from Backbone, Knockout, MOJS, then some guy in Hacker News says AngularJS is better. And then underscore prototype. Uh, now check out Lodash, and then this and that, and this and that, SugarJS, JSTring, blah, blah, blah. There are so many new things coming out. It's so hard to catch up. And you, you, they always look funky and cool, and you want to try them out. You want to integrate them. But I want to liberate you from this. I make you pay. 
So that's a little bit controversial, I know. But paying is not a is it's not a bug, it's a feature. So once you pay, you just use it. I had that feeling once when I was checking out tooltip tooltips like tooltip plugins to have a tooltip tip on your web page. So I went from JTIP to JSTIP to Tibbity tip tip and so on, switched, uh, bugs included. And eventually I paid $50 for a tooltip library that just does one thing, a tooltip, and did it well. And since then I, I had peace in mind. I could just use it and there was no more discussion what to do. And it was good as well. It got updated and things like that. And there was somebody, I, know, I knew somebody was actually sitting behind and kind of uh, responsible for it, feeling uh, yeah, financially motivated to work on it. So I'm going to do a license. It, uh, it's an open source license, HGPL and the commercial one. And I thought, well, I mean, that's the big question. How much money do you ask? And I thought, well, for a rational developer, he would gladly pay $390 because he saves so much time. He can just do it, da da da. But then I saw programmers, they're not really rational <laughs> beings. They, they think they are, but they're not. So I'm going for 190 US dollar uh, per developer. And basically that allows me to work full time on that library. And that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to get this thing out, make it nice, make it fast, make it good, make it consistent, make it perfect. The other option would be to freelance by the side, but then it's always the other things that you have to do. You have to freelance stuff, and maybe you get a pay rise, but I, I'm not interested in doing a pay rise. I want to do the RubyJS library. I found my, whatever it's called, my English isn't that good. <coughs> so yeah, that's it. It's 20 kilobytes, minified gzipped. And most important question, does it scale? Yes, it does. It's fast as fast as the rest, some usually faster, two or five times faster as Ruby, even though that's a very bad, very bad statement because we do different things and Ruby does some, some stuff more and a few things aren't that fast in RubyJS as well. Uh, some more features, destructive methods, I explained that before. You can use it as a utility belt or object oriented. You can pass around RubyJS objects and work with them. Uh, method arguments are all typecasted, so if you have a float and you want to run, you can give it a JavaScript primitive, you can give it a JavaScript number object, a RubyJS object, and it actually does duck typing, so you can give it any object that, that implements a toInt method, and it works. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what you've seen before. That was one big thing, the block arguments. So in Ruby, when you have a, an array of arrays, let's say coordinates, and you're iterating over them, and you just pass one arg argument to the block, then it, that pointing gives you back the array. If you pass x, y, like two arguments, it fills those variables up. And it also works with coffee, coffee script style syntax below. Uh, ranges, not so exciting. And yeah, so what do other people think? Angus, I don't want to fucking parlay JavaScript. Web components are the future, if only I could use it now. Tim, a vehicle of oppression frameworks. One year later, fighting oppression leads to depression. <laughs> Two years later, I wish I'd cut my hair by now. But right, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> Lessons learned from doing a uh, silly thing like that. Just do it. Just start working on it. Uh, it was a really silly experiment and everybody thought I'm crazy and I, I was obsessed with it. I just started doing it. I kind of thought it was not possible at all. But the more time I spent on it, I got some in, like, emotional investment in that library and I just had to make it work. And it eventually always worked out. And it's like... A, roller coaster ride in the end, like you're benchmarking stuff and it's just painfully slow and you feel like, what did I do? I have to stop doing it and that what happened two weeks ago. But it worked out. Technical stuff, type off. When I started doing JavaScript, everybody said, don't do type off, it's evil. 
So what type of actually does is if you give it a if you call type of with a primitive, it gives you back the, the name of the primitive. So if you call type of one, you get number or Boolean string undefined, and any, everything else is just an object. So it, it's very unpopular because if you call type of new number, you'd expect a number, but it, you get back an object because it is an object and it's not a JavaScript primitive. But the good thing about type of it's really, really, really fast. So let me make an example. That's uh, is number method where you can check whether the parameter is a number, and that's the default implementation of many libraries to call the object prototype to a string method with that object and check if it's a, an object number. The problem is it's really slow. How to make it quicker? Check first whether that object is, like, is actually a uh, JavaScript primitive, and that's usually the case when you're doing is number. And so I ran the little benchmark. So first I do is number, then the, the faster method is number fast. The third column is, is number fast if you give it a string. And then I'll show you the even faster optimization, optimized method. So a little blue thing is the unoptimized thing that's everywhere in the world in JavaScript. And the right thing is the optimized method. So it's not a little optimization, it's actually really 100 times faster. But if, to, if you uh, post that string to, a is number f to the is number fast method, it's still painfully slow because it's not a number, so it calls the object to string method. And that's when I realized, okay, why don't we check first if it's another JavaScript primitive, such as string, boolean, undefined. And I did so by asking, is it not an object? So basically I go first, is the object a number? Is it not an object? Then return quickly and save us time and performance. And in all the other cases, check if it's a, an object number. So this method, the two-string call, is actually only called when you're passing it a real JavaScript object. So once again, well it's a yeah. I mean, it's about the pain to to write that every time you're doing something like that. So you probably don't have to do it. But I have to do it because I'm writing a library that you're dependent on it. So in your code, you should, if you don't have a problem with performance, don't do it. If you get one, remember this slide. This type of thing sneaks in in quite a few other places, such as uh, the low dash underscore function. What it did is check, does an object, does the value object have a, a wrapped uh, property? so that it knows that it's already wrapped and it shouldn't wrap it again and just return. But the problem is if you're calling a, if you're checking for a property in a, on the JavaScript primitive, it actually converts that JavaScript primitive, as you can see below, into a new number object and then checks if that object has that property. And that's really slow. That's why we get that. And here again, if you're doing something like that, just check first, is it an object? If yes. Only then I call that uh, check for that op uh, property. <laughs> One more thing, 30 minutes. Spend this time on general project management. I did it and I think this little thing, it's a little script that checked how many methods have I already implemented and how many methods are missing. So dot is implemented, x is not implemented. Because of this little script, I have now RubyJS. Without it, I don't think I would have followed through implementing all these methods. Because at the end of the day, on a Sunday, nice evening, sun outside, people walking around, birds singing. And you're looking at these three axes at range. You cannot go outside and enjoy yourself. You have to implement these three methods so that you get a nice little yeah, bar. And it works really well. So if you have a, a big project, do something like that. Find, find an easy way to just call a script and see how much is implemented. While for, way faster than for each and the native ECMAScript 5 stuff. Let me show you. Uh, basically what you do is you, it's a classical for loop, but I'm using while because it's a little bit more concise in my opinion. You're just looping through it and call it callback instead of passing it to that uh, passing it to that native ECMAScript for each method. 
And it's way faster. It's five times faster or ten times or whatever. And same with map and here there's some more performance optimizations. It's faster to first create the array if you know how big it is and then to just assign the new thing to that to the right position instead of pushing it. And yeah, that's it. Launch time. I said, uh, yeah, I haven't launched it. I haven't really told it anybody. So I'm going to push it now. I've pushed it on the private repository. I'm just going to push the, the website. Ah. Do I have Wi Fi? Yes. And now you can go to rubyjs.org. Reload. You can start your Firebug console and start testing it out. Here you go. And yeah, I think if I don't have any more slides, then this is it. Woo! Any questions? Let's hear it for Sebastian. <laughs> I'm sure there's got to be a million questions. I've got a million. Questions? Um. I wonder if you've thought about making a soup in a non-optimized but very very small version or something. Maybe in, maybe it's a long-term goal that's 5K or something. You know, very very tiny. So in my in my case, I very rarely ha care about performance at all. I would love something super tiny. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yes. So the first goal is to be compliant to Ruby. I want to learn it. I want to get that done first. I want to have it perfect so that I know exactly how, how it's working because every day still I'm learning new stuff. And then that's one goal that I'm going to make a, a new or a, a different library or like make it like a, a separate build step so that it can just get the things you want. For example, the doc typing thing, it's not really useful for many people. I just want it to have it so that it's compliant to Ruby that people can trust that it works like Ruby and that can go from this to that, and that I fully understand. About the optimization, I don't think it doesn't really matter whether a library is 20 kilobytes or 5 or 10 kilobytes. If you're optimizing for that, then you're doing something wrong. Then you should check at your HTML page that you're sending to the client. That's probably 100 kilobytes anyway. Uh, try to optimize that. I don't think the whole obsession about small libraries, especially if you have a, like, a thing like Ruby Chess because it does everything for you. It's like, just get it and get over it. Worry about something else. And I haven't started even optimizing for fast size yet. About the performance thing, I, I don't think I'm going to change that because, uh, yeah, it's also a little bit consistent in itself. Like, do it the same way everywhere. All right. More questions? Uh, when you when you said uh, it's going to charge user, then I immediately immediately think of Ruby Motion. Um, yes. uh, that charge more, but uh, they offer a lots of development tools together with the development uh, uh, on mobile. So do you have other tools to support developing with Ruby JS, like uh, other Rectas or command line tools to test your uh, to test our code? kind of things like uh, do you have other uh, do I have other to tools help development so uh, I don't have any other tools I admit I plan on writing maybe a, like a coffee script similar thing that is spe specialized for Ruby JS because it has a few uh, coffee script has a few assumptions that I don't agree with such as it doesn't allow you to write an equals equals operator but if you know how to use it it's actually good and it can help you quite a bit 
or like working with string uh, with symbols or string to proc that's something that I want to have a, like a something like a coffee script that does it perfectly well and uh, out of the box so that it's even more ruby like and does some things that you're just used to uh, otherwise like rake task I mean you've got cake files or these JavaScript equivalents and they're basically the same because you can use the JavaScript, the Ruby JS stuff in there and the other thing is do I want to have more tools I want to concentrate first on the core lib as a like a runtime I want to give you the runtime but at the same time I want to start building up an ecosystem where other people can contribute to classes. They, I'm trying to make a marketplace out of it because I start to believe in the whole commercial software model that you actually pay and somebody's responsible for doing it. And I want to allow other people to support like other Ruby classes that depend on RubyJS or don't depend at all, but just give it a marketplace and then see how it evolves. Does that answer the question? Kind <laughs> of? Or do you think it's too expensive because RubyMotion also gives you rake tasks and... Yeah, I think uh, RubyMotion speeds up my device as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I expect, uh, because when I do Ruby, I expect uh, I can do something really fast. Uh, so I think it's a to do something like that. Well, it's the same. You got to, you've got your Ruby file, then you switch to JavaScript file and you can continue working the same way as you want so it speeds up development because you don't have to always have that overhead of keeping in, in memory or in the head how does the array slice method in JavaScript work and how does it work in, in Ruby how do I transform it from here and here does it really return the same things in every situation hmm. any other questions is that it <laughs> oh yeah sure it's pretty cool. I, I like it. Um, I like have you. you have you tried tossing it into like a, a Rails project? See how it plays with the, the built-in frameworks. Uh, uh, do you mean like a, as a gem? Yeah. Didn't have time to do that honestly, but that's on the list. Yeah, I want to make a, like a, a gem that you can just gem uh, Ruby JS and it's included and stuff like that. And all these little things, I'm really looking forward to doing that because that helps people tremendously. Okay, excellent. Well, Maybe thank one you more for thing. Yeah. And for everybody that wants a discount, come to me and give me your email address and I'm going to send out discount uh, licenses. Awesome. Well, awesome. we got a new library that's going to help us out a lot. Yes. So, thank you everybody, Sebastian. Thank you very much. <laughs>